Good morning. We have a busy schedule today, so I'm going to go ahead and begin. Is everyone who's in this cohort ready to go? All right. Um, my presentation today, our, the workshop actually, we're going to be doing some active learning, um, just like we would want our students to do, is creating effective and measurable learning outcomes. From 2004 until just about three weeks ago, I was a faculty member on this campus in the humanities program. Um, so I had to pay for my own parking when I came back today. Um, I am now the director of the Institute for Teaching and Learning in the Chancellor's Office. Um, so I'm really thrilled to be here today. I want to start off right away with an activity. We're going to start off with a poll. So, I want you to go back to the Cafe Learn Engagement Boot Camp and uh, under Course Design and Measurable Outcomes, there are two polls. The one we want to start with is poll number one. So if you would go there and do it, I'll pull it up on the screen here. So scroll down until you see, well, I don't have it on my screen yet. So you want to go into course design, and beneath that should be measurable learning outcomes. Perfect. So you go back to your printout. Right there. Great. So it's a pretty simple poll. True, false question. Who needs more time to complete the poll? Poll one, please. You can guess what's going to come next. There's only one question on the poll. You should be able to click on the answer. I don't know. <laughs> All right, has everybody had a chance to respond? Or a few people need a few minutes? So, Andrew, does this mean I have three responses so far? <laughs> okay. Just hit the, just click the bar. Ah, now we have 22 responses on... All right, now I'm going to, uh, it says reopen poll. So, Andrew, does that mean it's closed when I refreshed it? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, here I see 96% said, marked this is true, that learning can occur without teaching. So, those of you who said true, I'd just like a couple of examples, concrete examples of an instance when learning can occur without teaching. Popcorn style. Be, be more concrete. Give me a concrete example when you learn something without teaching occurring. I knew when not to take the ninth one when it's a certain hour. 
Okay, and so no one taught you that, but you learned it. All right, here at the front table. And your older brother burn his hand on the stove. Okay, good. And here in the checkered shirt. Okay, and what you said earlier, the, the abstract conclusion is that those are all forms of experiential learning. Did anybody say false? You want to give us a concrete example? That there is some teaching going on. Yeah. Okay, now this was set up as a true false question. Uh, I just wanted to demonstrate for you how this works. Let's now go to the second poll, poll two. So I need to hit back, Andrew. And you'll see poll number two is a similar question. And it's located higher. If you're using Cafe Learn, of course, you can control the order in which things appear within the course site. All right. The responses are coming up a little faster this time. All right, this time I'm going to assume we can do it a little faster. So I'm going to ask Andrew to go ahead and close the poll, if he didn't already. So this time I just flipped the question, teaching can occur without learning, uh, true or false, and the majority here said true. Um, those of you who said true, let's take a couple of concrete examples this time as well. An example when teaching occurs without learning. We've never seen this, have we? <laughs> Not ever? Every Monday. Every Monday. OK. All right. Let's hear a couple of answers and then see if we see a pattern here. Jose said every Monday. When I see students are sleeping. When their students are sleeping. OK. Any 8 o'clock class. Any 8 o'clock class. And none of you are doing that right now, are you? We're all focused. We learned how to focus. OK, so anybody who said false? OK, all right, very good. I, I think it just depends on how you define teaching. OK. The process of someone learning from students. OK. OK, good. Hold on to that thought. We'll come back to it. At, back at the table where the first response was. Um, I, I, did, I used this question differently. I used this question as a teacher and not as a student. I think that's why I picked false. But then I heard some of the other responses. I thought, well, I need to put the most people could do. I thought it as, like, as a teacher, how am I going to teach a material if I didn't know it? That's why I picked false. OK. I All right. Linda Nilsson, who's uh, at uh, expert in faculty development. She's at Clemson. Um, and I'll share some of her work with you if you're interested. Um, she has said that the first instance that learning can occur without teaching, when that happens, no harm is done. But when teaching occurs without learning, particularly if it's in higher, a higher education setting, well, I'm not going to finish that sentence, right? But that's not what we want to have happen. Um, OK, so now what I'd like you to do is, sorry, I'm having a little trouble with this mouse here. Um, now I want to turn to one more activity uh, at your table. And it has two parts. It's a reflection activity. And if you're old school like me and you like having a pen in your hand and you have a piece of paper, you can do this on a piece of paper, but if you have totally trans, uh, transplanted yourself into the digital 
generation, the digital landscape, and you want to do this on a computer, um, on a word processor, that's fine. I would like you, actually, I'm going to set my timer for two minutes, and I would like you to write for a moment and reflect on these two questions. First of all, did the results of the poll or any of the examples surprise you? And the second question is, what can faculty do to keep teaching and learning linked? And I'm actually going to set my timer on my cell phone for two minutes. Um, now what I'd like you to do is turn, and you can either speak with one person at your table or you can have a conversation at the table, and I'd like you to spend another two minutes discussing what we as faculty can do to keep teaching and learning linked, to ensure that when we're doing something that we would define as teaching, that there is learning going on. All right, so another two minutes, and this time you can talk with a colleague, pairs, or as a group. And you probably know this is where this is going. At the end, I'll want each table to pick a spokesperson who can share one thing. let you know that took a lot more time than I expected, so I'm going to push the boundary a bit. On, we have until 11.15. All right, that was two minutes. I always hate to interrupt when there's great conversation going on. You're going to have more time to share together this afternoon. So what I'd like to do now, um, and again, be, just reflect here as I continue to talk about whether or not that two minutes was too little or too much for you. What I certainly want to stress is that a lot can happen in two minutes. If we get our students to get on task very quickly, I think we often find that it's not very satisfying and we want to go further. Um, but what I'm going to do now as a share out is I'm going to ask for one person at each table to share with the whole group one thing that you heard that was interesting. And the rule here is that successive tables cannot repeat anything that's already been said. So quick, which table wants to go first? All right, Michael. <laughs> so, so our table, it was kind of interesting because we spent interactive discussion engagement. It was very important. Uh, Eric brought up a point, though, that the students have been conditioned for 12, 13 years when they come into our classroom for certain behaviors. So. Okay, good, thank you. And I forgot to give one more instruction, but Michael modeled it for me. Try to be succinct. 
I know as faculty in that old model, we can talk forever. Try to be to the point. So thank you. Someone else, something different at another table. Here. A couple of things we talked about uh, was to demonstrate the passion we have for the topic, because otherwise, how can we expect the students? Also to cover things in a, in a, cover things in a way that are relevant to the students. Okay. And also not to be afraid, I think, to start with examples, even though that may be counter to the way we might approach the content. Good. That's three good things, passion, relevant, examples. Another table? Do a couple more of these here. Uh, yeah, well, we said that our job isn't so much to teach but to facilitate learning. So there's no problem with a decoupling of the teaching and the learning. Exactly. And actually, we can't force anybody to learn, right? What we can do is try to teach in a way that creates conditions that are more conducive to more people learning more and retaining it longer in a way that they can use it in actual situations when they go out into the world. One more thing here. You know, we discussed about that, you know, having the measurement outcome from uh, the polls and also, uh, you know, use the purpose of each gesture. So as how can they apply it in their personal life immediately? They have gained something. And I would, I would connect that to the word transparent. Now, I'm going to stop now, even though I'd really like to hear what happened at every table. We're learning this new technology. It took us a little longer to get those polls going. So I want to move to the real point of this, which is to actually think about how we're writing effective outcomes. But I want you to see here that what I'm trying to model is that students can learn from each other. And we can make that effective in the classroom by having them talk in small groups and then doing the share out efficiently where we build. And the idea of not letting any table repeat is that students are less likely to tune out while the sharing is happening if they know that they're going to hear something new every time someone shares. Uh, OK, so um, this is an image related to one of the metaphors that's in the Cafe Learn uh, platform. It's a blueprint. Why do architects and engineers create blueprints? And why do they create details? Anybody want to answer that question? Michael? So they can visualize what they're building you know, and right. show other people. And I know this image up top isn't very clear. The resolution is not what I would like it to be. Uh, I believe it's a blueprint of the Golden Gate. And I don't know how they actually bent the Golden Gate, but if they started from two sides and met in the middle, it's really important that they not only had a blueprint in the beginning, but they had some details. It's got to be pretty precise. So the two ends of those bridge meet in the middle so that it can perform its intended function, which is to get people safely from one side of the bay to the other. And, and so certainly you can see perhaps where I'm going here is that one thing that we as faculty can do, a very important thing that we can do to make sure that teaching and learning remain linked so that they happen in the same place is we can focus on design. And um, there are several approaches to design. If I think back to my college education um, and I look at the syllabuses that I was given, they seemed very content driven. And some people would say that prior to 1990 or so, this was really the predominant paradigm in higher education. The courses were designed to cover material, if I were going to teach a course, let's say, on the Harlem Renaissance, and one of my former students is in the room, he's back there taping, I might have started, sorry, there's my image, I might have started with a literary work at the beginning of the movement, and I would have proceeded, and in the last week, you'd be likely to find a literary work produced near the end of the movement. And I would have been designing my course to cover the content. I would have then put a midterm in the middle, because it's a midterm after all, and a final exam at the end. And um, I might have then included some other assignments where it was convenient in, for me in the term to do the grading. Um, another version of this, of course, is being textbook centered, where in week one, we, cha we cover chapter one, in week two, chapter two, and so on. And where we are now, um, and it's, of course, change takes a long time to occur, but we're much more focused on being outcome-centered. And this also moves the focus to the students. What do we want the students to be able to know and do and value 
by the end of our courses. Um, now, if you're like me, you were trained to be an expert in your discipline. Um, were you also trained to be an expert in teaching, which means knowing something about how people learn? Um, and I'm just going to give a quick summary here. These are three things from a meta study of research into teaching and learning over several decades. Um, we first, first of all, we know that prior knowledge matters. Students come to our classrooms with prior knowledge, and when they learn something new, they have to attach it to a framework. So it's important to know whether they're coming with prior knowledge that is helpful or is not going to be helpful to their learning. So the activity I did at the beginning was the kind of activity you could do at the beginning to figure out where students are at the beginning of a class or the beginning of a course. We also know, and perhaps need to be reminded sometimes, that novices are not experts. Once we become experts in a discipline, we almost forget what it was like to be a novice. In other words, it's so natural now the way I read as a literary critic that I almost don't remember how I read before I became an expert. To be an effective teacher, I need to think about that and design my courses to help move students from seeing my discipline as a novice does to seeing it as an expert. And then we also know um, that metacognition, thinking about thinking, and I think when the comment from this table, which I connected to transparency, um, if we get students to think on why we're having them do what they're doing, um, then we know that can help bridge the gap between being an expert and a novice. And there's my citation there. I'm summarizing very quickly the work of Bransford, Brown, and Cocking and how people learn. Um, and then I'll just say quickly, I was first exposed to this in a former life when I was a tenant organizer in New York City. I was training uh, people who owned and building, lived in buildings owned by the city to manage them. And I was very young, and they were much older than I was, usually. And my goal was to teach them to manage their buildings effectively so they could buy them from the city and be owners of the buildings. And I had a pretty progressive boss who handed me Paolo Freire's Pedagogy of the Pre Oppressed. It's a little bit radical, but that's where I was introduced to the idea of the banking concept, right, where professors are experts who give the gift of knowledge to students who are presumed to not know a lot. And teachers teach and students are taught, it's very passive. So that image on the left there of pouring knowledge into a head is not where we want to go. So if we're going to design our classes well, we want to engage in backward design. We want to start at the end. Where do we want them to be at the end and then move back? Um, design backward, deliver forward. Um, the biggest question we can ask is what's the goal of the institution? What's the mission? What does it mean to be college educated? How does my course contribute to that? What do I want? What am I teaching students that is going to be meaningful to them five and ten years from now? And how does that contribute to the overall education? Then we work backwards. If I'm teaching in a program, whether it's a general education program or a major, what are the students supposed to be able to know, do, and value by the end of that that they're going to retain? And then we get down to the level of the course. And then we can even break that down into the level of the unit or the lesson. I will say that I was introduced to this, right, the idea of having outcomes at the course level when I was a graduate student. But I guess I have to confess that it's only fairly recently that I've really let it sink in that it's not going to hurt and it's actually going to help quite a lot for me to think about that at the module and lesson level. Now again, this is a very quick survey. Uh, some of you are going to be familiar with these things, but if we think about setting learning outcomes for our students and defining them, we can define outcomes into three general categories. Cognitive, right? Thinking. Psychomotor, the physical ability to manipulate an object, which is relevant to some disciplines. Is anybody here from a health science profession? Nursing, for example, or physical therapy, right? Psychomotor outcomes are important to those disciplines. Dance, theater, right? Singing, mu music, even at the 
higher education level. And then there are also affective outcomes, which we don't always talk a lot about, but these are the emotional outcomes. What, how do we want students to feel or react to the material that we're teaching them? Now, this may also seem familiar, and if those of you are already working with the engagement specialist from Cafe Learn, maybe you've worked with this a bit. Um, for cognition, uh, we turn to Bloom, who in 1955 set up this taxonomy, the one on, sorry, 1956, the one there on the left. More recently, that taxonomy of cognition has been revised by Anderson and Kratwall. And if you just notice quickly, what the revision has done is move from nouns to uh, verb forms. Sometimes it's written as gerunds, remembering. Um, and create is now at the top of the pyramid. Now we could get into debates about whether or not um, create is the highest level of highest order thinking for your discipline. Um, but what I want, the reason I'm showing you this taxonomy today is just, just what it suggests to us is that if we want to move students to higher order thinking, that there is a progression, right? That we do need to think about what's the foundational knowledge, what are the concepts they need to be familiar with, but then if we really, if the ultimate goal is for them to apply those things in real life situations, then we want to be sure that our teaching is giving them the opportunity to do that. Um, and as we look at outcomes, we're going to focus on Bloom's taxonomy quite a bit. Um, but let me just let you know that there are other frameworks out there for designing outcomes for your course. D. Fink has done a lot of study, uh, a lot of research with college students, actually, to figure out when does significant learning occur. And if you'll notice in his taxonomy here, um, it's drawn so it's less hierarchical, it's more like an interactive process that you might, your course might go through several times, and his point is that there are six kinds of learning that occur. Three of them over here on the right are what we've traditionally thought of as cognitive activities, right? What's the foundational knowledge? This is really getting the basic concepts <clears throat> and then uh, being able to apply them, which involves knowing the processes for using them. And then he points out that students need to be able to integrate those and pull them together. But then coming up the other side of his diagram here as schematic, he adds human dimension, that students need to be thinking about what does this knowledge mean for me to be human? How does it change my experience of being human and interacting with other people? Um, how does it uh, invoke caring, right? How does it help shape values? People mentioned here passion, right? We have passion for our disciplines. How do we help students have passion for our discipline? Maybe that can be an outcome too. And then we also need to <coughs> acknowledge that the kindergarten teachers didn't teach our students all they needed to know about how to learn. They taught them a lot. I spent one year as a second grade teacher, and I developed a great respect for elementary school teachers. I also learned I would have to learn a lot about child development to do well in that situation. Um, but even at the level of higher education, we need to help students reflect on how to learn. It's a lifelong process. After all, we'll, we're still doing it, and I hope some of that's going to happen here today. All right. Now, some of this, I'm going to move through this a little bit quickly because I don't know where you all are. Um, many of us are coming from different places, but when we're going to write objectives, and maybe you already have objectives, and what you want to focus some of your time on today is how to write them better, how to refine them, um, you could certainly start, if you were um, brand new to the course, um, you want to know from someone like the dean, are there outcomes that are mandated by an accreditor? or by the institution? And do I, as the instructor or the faculty of the course, have the ability to modify them? The next place we could go is to research the history of the course. Why was it proposed? What other courses should it prepare students for? And who are the students? And then, are there institutional learning outcomes and program learning outcomes that my course is supposed to be contribute to? 
And then perhaps where we should focus our energies today, what should students who've taken this course be able to know, do, or value by the end? Um, okay, now I'm running a lot more short on time than I hoped I would be. So these next few slides, what I want to say is that, well, first of all, let me ask, how many of you have outcomes for your course already? Okay, now what we want to do is make sure that they are what I'll call mapped, measurable, appropriate, and precise, right? So if they're measurable, then um, students can demonstrate their learning in a way that can be measured and observed. So your outcome should read something like, upon completion of this course, students will be able to do something. It should begin with an action verb that describes behavior that can be observed or evaluated. So an example of a measurable outcome would be at the end of this course, students will be able to deliver a carefully constructed persuasive speech to a well-defined audience. That's different from students should have gained greater knowledge of how to give a speech or public speaking. They should be appropriate, <clears throat> so they should match what is taught and the means of assessment. So a multiple choice quiz can measure ability to recall a definition, but it cannot measure ability to explain a concept. And, um, sorry, I just went the other way. Um, one of the ways that we think about outcomes being appropriate is thinking about Bloom's taxonomy, right? Are our outcomes set up and thus our means of assessment set up so that we move students to higher order thinking? Um, a lot of people calling, um, it, getting us to think about redesign our courses, want to point out that we want to remember that the point of higher education is to get students to higher order thinking. And then we want to be sure they're precise. They should specify the behavior, the conditions under which it will be formed, and the degree of mastery expected. Now, this is where we might do some work today. Um, if I give you some examples of outcomes that are precise, um, on all written exam assignments and exams, students will use correct grammar and spelling. So the behavior there is to use grammar and spelling, uh, the conditions on written assignments and exams, and the, um, sorry, <laughs> uh, measurable, um, sorry, behavior, condition, and degree. The degree would be correct. Okay, um, and so if we're moving backwards, again, we want to think about what will students do at the end of the course. If we have a culminating assignment, I used to have a final exam at the end, I want to think about what are they going to do with that final exam, and therefore, or let's say it's a culminating assignment, a research project, what do I need to be sure that they can do so that I, what's the mediating outcome to make sure they can do well on that research project and what are the foundational outcomes. And what that enables us to do is to think about how are they going to learn what they need to do, what are the materials, and what are the activities they're going to engage in. All right, now I've only left five minutes here, um, but what I'd like to do is for you to take one outcome from your course, whether it's a outcome that comes near the end or one that comes near the beginning and write it out and I want you to take a couple of minutes to ask yourself, is it measurable? Could it be more measurable? How are you going to assess it? What foundation knowledge is needed and what process knowledge? So I want you to take a few minutes to look at your outcome, write it out on a piece of paper or have it so you can share and then I want you to turn to a colleague and um, let them read it and reflect back for you how it might be strengthened, all right? So take a few minutes to write your outcome out and then share it with someone else. All right, I'm, I'm going to bring us back together here. I haven't seen them open the door in the other room. Do you know how they're doing? Okay. So. We're a few minutes over and assuming the other room is. What I hear is that some conversations have been started that I hope will continue.
And so let me, let me draw an analogy here. If we think about, um, everyone here is from California, correct? Okay, um, architects and engineers constantly have to um, reorient how they draw their blueprints. Every time there's an earthquake, I don't want to mention it, <laughs> um, the building code changes because we learn more about the physical forces that can be applied to our physical infrastructure, and so we uh, revise the building code so that our buildings will be built safer. And hopefully along with that, the architects and engineers and then those who construct the buildings revise their practices based on what we know. So as a faculty in higher education, we can do the same thing. As we learn more about how people learn, then we can redesign our courses. And starting with the outcomes is an uh, obvious place to start. Let me say, I'm implying here by this workshop being first, that outcomes is where you start. And as you get more, as you think about being more precise about how the outcomes will be assessed, the more precise you get, you almost start to have indicated what your students need to learn, what they might need to read, but also what kind of activities they need to engage in in order to be able to do that. Um, so what I'm going to do now is to show you how I would wrap up a lesson in a class. Um, sometimes this is called a 3 to one activity, and again, this is in the Engage Learning Boot Camp. There is, it's called a wrap up, Andrew, what title do we give it? The wrap up? Wrap, wrap up questions. Wrap up questions. Um, and these are open questions, so you can go into the website and do this now. Um, actually, I would love if you would do it because it would give me some feedback, but you can also do this on your paper. I've written three questions here. Sometimes these are done as wrapper activities at the end of a class, and they take the form of a three, two, one. What are three things you learned today? What are two things you want to know more about? And what is one thing that you're going to do? I simplified it because I was worried we were going to be a little tight on time. Um, so I'll ask you to think about this, and I'd actually like you to write it down. I would love it if you would do it in the engagement boot camp so I can get some feedback. What's one thing you've learned so far today? The second thing would be, what's one thing you want to know more about? And the third thing would be, what's one thing you'll apply in your teaching? All right, I know it's going to take you a little bit of time to finish up your wrap-up. Um, so my closing slide is the idea I will leave you with, which is a quote from Herbert Simon, which is that learning results from what the student does and thinks, and only from what the student does and thinks. So in getting you to look again at how your learning objectives are written, one of my goals was for you to think about how your outcomes could be written to make sure that students are doing and thinking things that will lead to learning.